you would tell us uh, who you are and a little bit about your history with the Amiga and with Commodore. Okay, I'm Dave Haney, and I started working at Commodore in uh, October of 1983. Um, that was first on the um, Plus Four project, as you know it. It wasn't actually called the Plus Four then. Um, and then on the Commodore 128. And when Commodore bought Amiga, I went out and got an Amiga as fast as I could because I understood what it was, at least to some extent, compared to the types of computers we built before. So I was actually programming the Amiga on my own with DiskSell before I started doing engineering work. I did engineering work on the 2000. Well, let me back up a little. What happened was I started out, I had been on the C128. I was the senior member of the C128 team left. And we started to um, take on Amiga projects. And the first Amiga project was the Amiga 500. That was started by George Robbins and um, his group. So um, I guess his group was just Bob Welland. It was, it was not a big group. So I went to help them out with the idea that maybe, since I was a low-end guy, I would take over the Amiga 500 and George would move on to adopting that technology for the Amiga 2000, which was originally specified by the German group. Okay, so George didn't want to give up the 500. That was his baby, so I got to take over the Amiga 2000. And from there, I did, um, I worked on the first 020 accelerator card with Bob Welland. I did the 030 card. I worked on the Amiga 3000 with, uh, with uh, actually the largest team we ever had on a system. Uh, six people were involved in the hardware. <laughs> and um, then uh, after that, um, Greg Berlin went on to do the 3000T. I was starting to get involved with the AA project, which was a chip project, but they're, they were going to need a board to put these chips in once the chips were ready. So I worked on that. Um, and built a prototype called the Omega 3000 Plus, which we wanted to make in production at the time. Um, that that actually, as well as having the double A chips, it had a DSP on it. It could do 16-bit sound. It could do uh, software modem. Unfortunately, the project was canceled, and parts of that became parts of that eventually found their way into the Omega 4000, but not the DSP. And I also worked on the prototype for the uh, AAA board. I worked on uh, various other things that never got released, um, as Commodore was sort of fading away. Um, but that's the, the, the 3000, 2000, 4000 is what I guess I'm mainly known for, as well as this cell. You've continued to support the Amiga through the Usenet and other outlets. How come? Well, I guess, uh, you know, it's a force of habit. No, I mean, I really, you know, I really enjoyed being part of the whole thing. I thought that you could, you could support a system differently than had been done in the past. You could, uh, this actually started on the Commodore 128. I used to go on uh, Quantum Link, wish I bought some Quantum Link stock. You know, Quantum Link mutated into AOL. <laughs> I used to go on Quantum Link and uh, give C128 conferences once a month. Um, basically, to it was it was actually very useful to touch base with the users and find out what they liked, what they didn't like, you know, from an engineering perspective, just just you know, being part of the community. So, you know, I I kept doing that when I when I moved into the Amiga, and we had a few other guys who were pretty uh, you know pretty regular at that back in the old days. And yeah, I guess I've just kept it up as much as I you know as much as time permits. And I also had software. I mean, I wrote a lot because I like to write. And magazines were always saying, hey, Dave, you want to write an article? And I said, sure, I'd like to write an article. So, um, you know, I, I had a little more free time back then. <laughs> but, yeah, I, you know, it's just, I mean, I, you know, it, I guess, you know, once you become part of it, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to stop. What's with the macadamia nuts, man? I like macadamia nuts. I think it was in one version of Disk Salve. I said, you know, it was like, oh well, you know. I thought, well, shareware. I said, so, you know, send me, uh, you know, send me, uh, you know, ten dollars or something good, like, you know, macadamia nuts. I think I had said so. Like, you know, from then on, I'm always getting macadamia nuts. I like macadamia nuts, though. If you get them in the shell, they're, the only thing harder than a macadamia nut shell is maybe a diamond. So you, you know, it's. It, 
you, if, you, if you want to eat like a handful of macadamia nuts with shells, it's going to be an all-day process with hammers and special tools. And so it's, you know, the kind without shells are usually a little bit easier to deal with. But it's also why they're so expensive, because they have to, you know, use something extremely hard to open them. And diamond chisels. Diamond chisels, and, you know, I don't know, they train monkeys to do it or something. Yeah. <laughs> you must have some wild tales from your past. What's the one that sticks out the most? Oh, that would be hard. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I guess the you know the wildest thing was that that happened was you know it was probably some of the depressing stuff like the end of Commodore when we were you know we had the, that whole deathbed vigil thing that I filmed and that was like you know I mean just the you know that was sort of a culmination of years and years of frustration with the company. Um, yeah, I don't know if there was any one significant thing. I mean, there's. The, the thing is, you're immersed in this, you know, day to day, and everything that goes along is sort of just part of it. I don't, you know, there wasn't anything that really stuck out, but because it was all like that. I mean, it was, you know, it was pretty wild times. I mean, you know, from an engineering point of view, it was like, wow, you know, I get if I if I don't want it to if I don't want to do something a certain way, I can do it a different way. You don't have the freedom of that on a PC or a Mac. Um, you're not the designer, but I mean, even you know, even at those, you know, we we had a, you know, as an individual, a lot more um, control. Like I was saying, I was you know, I was I was I did the Amiga 2000 almost by myself. It was based on the Amiga 500 stuff, but if you looked at Apple, they would have had 25 people on a project like that. I'm not sure what they all would have been doing, but they would have had 25 people on a project like that. So you know, it was it was just there was this level of intensity that. Um, Pretty much, you know, it was, it was in everything you did. You, you worked hard, you played hard. Maybe you didn't sleep much, but <laughs> that's kind of a thing anyway. I usually, I usually only sleep three or four hours a night anyway, so. Now, Commodore bought uh, Amiga from J Minor? From Amiga Inc., um, which J Minor was the CEO of, yes. Um, basically, Amiga was like many other companies. It was a startup company. It was funded by different venture capitalists, and near the end, it was funded by Atari. Jay had worked for Atari before, um, not um, during the Jack Tramiel regime, however. Jack Tramiel, of course, left Commodore, went to Atari. He wanted to buy the Amiga, but the way Jack liked to work was that he'd loan you some money and then hope that nobody came in to bail you out, and he'd call for that money back and basically get the company real cheap. And So Atari was negotiating to buy Amiga at a very, very low price. and. Um, they thought pretty much that nobody else was interested and they were going to get this and Commodore had secretly been meeting with uh, with Amiga and um, I, I don't know exactly who was negotiating I mean I did know this at one point but I forget but anyway they they named a price that was like 10 times more than Atari had offered and Commodore went for it <laughs> so which which was good for these guys and so they you know so basically the you know the the very very you know this this was happening like right down to the wire before Atari came in to um, call their loan and so the Atari guy comes in and sits down and gets a check which is not what he was expecting, <laughs> which was not what he was expecting. so uh, it, and it was really we really liked that because you know there was sort of this you know I mean Commodore Atari had always been a rivalry because we were building similar machines but once Jack Tramiel went out there. Then, of course, it was like you know he was you know he, he went there because he could buy Atari, and he wanted Atari to become the next Commodore, and he wanted to kill Commodore because of course they had kicked him out. <laughs> so um, and and it was a good thing too because Atari had a habit of buying something and then basically dismantling the team and they weren't. Not that Commodore was perfect in this regard, but. Atari would have been much worse. Everybody, everybody knew that your your last resort was selling out to Atari. Unfortunately, sometimes that happened, like with uh, with uh, Dave and RJ and the uh, Handy, which became the Atari Lynx. Mm -hmm. So, how much of the the 500 2000 chipset? Uh, was derived or based on the original 1000. Well, the ECS chips were basically the same chips. I mean, they had they what they had is the chips that were done in California were done using fairly primitive means. So um, they brought them into Westchester and br took the designs into modern CAD systems and added some not a lot of features, but added some features for ECS. The the major thing they did was the Fat Agnes, which brought in a lot of like 
what we call glue pieces, a lot of extra pieces you needed to make the system complete. Um, and it reduced a considerable amount of cost because the parts that were brought in were not complicated, but they were expensive. And um, that was kind of, that's basically what Bob Welland and uh, Victor Andrade, who was a uh, ship designer, had worked out how to do this fat Agnes that was going to lower the cost of the systems. Um, Paula was totally unchanged. Denise was tweaked a little bit, but not, you know, not radically changed. Um, they did things like making sure that hold, hold and modify mode worked uh, right, and um, oh, there's one. Oh, the the, uh, the uh, half bright mode was added, but it wasn't it wasn't a major change. It was it was all fairly simple, um, but so the, you know the, it wasn't a big change, and it took it took a lot long, took a lot longer than it should have. But it it was quite often that Commodore didn't the engineering just didn't get the money they needed to make things happen at a proper speed. It was always, I mean, you could kind of fake it some places, like software people who are willing to work, for, you know, 16-hour days rather than 8-hour days. Um, you know, hardware people doing the same, chip designers doing the same. But when you need to make a chip, you need to make a chip. It's an expensive thing to do even when you own the foundry. So it was, you know, we, we weren't always happy with the results. I mean, we, we liked what we did, but, we, you know, it didn't happen fast enough. Of course, part of that's engineering. I mean, every time I finished a computer, it's like, Next, this one's done, uh, and you know, and I was, and all I could see was the flaws. You know, it's everyone else says, "Oh, this is great," and I look like, "Oh man," but it should have been. I would, you know, I wish I could have done this. I wish I could have done that. Um, you know, not not that they were like foolish decisions or anything. It's just that it, you know, it might not have been possible to do things a certain way. So, which I guess is good because if your job is making the next good thing, and you've already been, you know, so the A three thousand comes out, I've already been using it for a year <laughs> or so. <laughs> Was there a feeling a lot that you were fighting against the company or that the, the engineers were fighting the company? Not until the end. Um, up until about 1991, we weren't because uh, basically up until then, um, the, comp the engineering department was, uh, was run by uh, Henry Rubin and Jeff Porter, and they were very supportive of engineering. Um, they basically shielded us from any nonsense with the company, and about the only thing that you could say was that we just didn't get as much, you know, we weren't, they, they weren't investing enough in R&D my belief. Um, they should have been spending more. But it wasn't like there was a, an active fight. Well, after, in 1991, I guess it was maybe a little bit before that, but by 1991, um, uh, Irving Gould, who was the major stockholder, he owned about 20% of Commodore, had, had installed Mehdi Ali as the uh, chief, um, the CEO, president of, of Commodore International. And Mehdi was going from department to b department, putting his own people in place. And he brought in this guy, Bill Sidness, to take over engineering. And Bill had a fairly uh, spotty track record. He was the guy who almost put Franklin Computer out of business by doing Apple clones without actually having a license to use the software. And he was the, he was the point guy on the uh, IBM PC Junior not a successful machine and apparently there were some scandals and all but for some reason Mehdi Ali thought he would be a good guy to run engineering and he he promised to take we had a we had a computer that was sort of just starting up called the Amiga 300 it was going to be almost like a Commodore 64 shr shrunk down even smaller than an A500 cheap um, not sure exactly what was going in there. Is that the thing that has the disk drive in the front? No that's actually something else. Um, what is that? That's the C65 whole another story but anyway um, George George Robbins was working on this computer and met and Bill Sidney's came in and said well we we don't want this we want to add this we want to add this we want to add this so th th that's what became the Amiga 600 now the Amiga 500 was still a very popular computer we were still selling them the Amiga 600 came along and people didn't want it because you couldn't stick the accelerator cards inside because you couldn't stick a, a SOTS board on it had PCM CIA which you know, in time might not have been such a bad idea, but back then that was a very expensive thing that was only for laptops because laptops were very expensive back then. So, but it was a PC thing, so Bill, Bill wanted it in there. So what happened was, rather, Bill promised Medi that the uh, that that the Amiga 600 would cost fifty dollars less than the Amiga 500. It ended up costing like fifty dollars more than the Amiga 500, but 
you know, because of politics, they put out the Amiga 600 anyway, and because they knew that nobody would want it if the Amiga 500 was still available, they canceled the Amiga 500, which, as I've said before, to my knowledge, is the only time in Commodore history that a, that a successful and still selling product was ever canceled. Because Commodore usually is like, whatever they want, we'll make. <laughs> so um, that's when that's when we really the beginning of when we had to start arguing, fighting with engineering, and it was also very difficult under the Sydney's regime, which only lasted about a year, but, you know, morally, it, you know, it, it broke a lot of, you know, a lot of the good feelings we had, because I had, I had five separate Skunk Works projects going on at the same time, because he wouldn't approve anything, for real. <laughs> Are you getting any mic noise? Table? A little bit. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I just wanted to let you know about tapping the table. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, we we have a really sensitive microphone. I got um, a robot. <laughs> Tell us more about Disk Salve, Disk Doctor. Okay. Stuff. Okay. Well. Well, as I mentioned, before I was even working on the Amiga, I was still doing C128 stuff, I, I bought this Amiga and I had some project which was like real important, I forget what it was, you know, and I got a disk error and I couldn't read my floppy. This, this was a problem and I had, I had read just in the documentation that the Amiga file system was this incredibly robust thing. And so I went to uh, Carolyn and at Katz and said, I need, a, uh, I need a disk repair tool and then she said, well, you can try this thing called Disk Doctor. It's not finished yet, and I tried it, and it made things worse. And, <laughs> and so I said, I came back the next day, and I said, "That doesn't work. Um, what else do you have?" And so there was Disk Ed, and I got the Disk Ed, and I got a DOS manual, and I went through and basically reverse engineered all the missing parts of how the file system worked, and then wrote the first Disk Salve, which basically just found stuff on the you know in on the disk and copied it to something else it was very primitive it just it had hardwired floppy controls in there and and um, it, and I just put it out and people liked it and sometimes sent me macadamia nuts <laughs> and so from there it was like well okay now you know like a year later or so people are starting to use hard disks and um, so I, I figured out how to get hard disks working and then you know oh graphics hey wouldn't it be nice to put a graphic front end on it so a little bit before uh, 2.0 came out, I started working on graphics, and everybody was looking at the next machine in the hallway. And so I started making things that looked pretty on the uh, on the 1,000 by 800 screens we all had, on our Amigas that looked a little nexty. And um, and but the the um, software people were working as sort of working out the you know the new look that became 2.0 at the same time. And they convinced me to uh, to adapt. The, the new GAD tools and things like that to Disk Salve, and at the same time, they wanted to buy Disk Salve. But unfortunately, um, there was a rule that you can't buy anything from Commodore, you know, you can't buy Commodore stuff from Commodore employees. So I they did. just wanted you to give it away. Well, yeah, basically, so then they came and said, well, we'd like you to give it away. And I'm like, no, I can't do that because, um, and in fact, I had, at the time, I had been talking to, uh, I had been talking to a friend of mine who was getting into the publishing business, Dale Larson. So um, I put out Disk Self 2, which is another shareware version. And then I started improving things even more, making the graphics a little better and, and things for Disk Self 3. And that's when we put that one out commercially. And I, in the first month of commercial sales, I got more Disk Self sales than I had total registrations for the like five years by this time that it had been out in shareware. So that was the right decision. It, you know, because either either it's either getting to more people or at least more people are buying it. And I also I'd also made a deal with um, with uh, the the German company uh, Schastrus or whatever. It's it's treasure chest in German, and uh, they they were putting it out in German. So we we pretty much covered the Amiga world with discs out by then, and it was nice to see something in a commercial package. And um, you know now it's on the CD, so you can still get it. Um, the the uh, uh, disc repair kit CD and one of these days I'm going to dig the sources out and give them to somebody who will update it so it works on larger discs and now you have that on tape. <laughs> what are your feelings about where the Amiga is headed? Well it's nice to see it heading in some direction other than down. <laughs> um, 
actually, I got a pretty good feeling this time because I, you know, talked to Bill privately. I talked, you know, I saw all the, all the presentations and everything, and um, you know, they they aren't. It isn't the same monkey business we've seen before. He's, you know, he's doing stuff that's really going to happen, I believe. Um, the Amiga DE stuff is pretty interesting to me, simply because I'm doing some of the same kinds of things at Metabox, and uh, you know, I'm not saying there is necessarily going to be, but we 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 probably look into you, you know, to whether we can use that or not to help us get there because we're. You know, we're in, we're kind of in the appliance space. They're they're doing appliance things. They don't want to build hardware, which means that we could be partners because we don't really we we write software, but we our main goal is selling hardware. We'll sell it running anything it needs to run to be the best possible product. Um, I was actually kind of surprised about the uh, announcements on PowerPC and Amiga Four, um, Amiga S Four Point Zero because I wasn't expecting that one at all. And that's good to see. I'm sure H and P are involved in that too, because you know, which, but it's you know, it's nice because it does kind of develop a continuity that you know that might have been lacking if Amiga DE was the only answer. Um, you know, people have something new to go to. Um, it'll be a little more familiar, and eventually they'll integrate the the DE stuff with it. The technology behind DE is really neat. I it, it's it's funny, but I like. Right after Gateway crumbled um, and Fleecy went nuts and you know wanted something to do to keep him from uh, breaking walls down or something, we started this Kosh project, which is basically just kind of this internet think tank about new operating systems. And I got involved because I'd, I'd been talking to Fleecy about this whole crisis, and I guess he was you know he was talking to me mainly maybe because I had gone through the whole thing at Commodore and you know and I'd said oh you know I've been thinking about this thing too and um, you know so, sort of the way the technology um, is done is very similar to what we were talking about at Kosh, where you have a you have a, a, an object-oriented operating system that, because it's it's perfect abstraction, anything underneath it, anything can be underneath the, the application layer. So you could have Windows under there, you could have a microkernel under there, you could have Linux under there, and it doesn't matter what's underneath because that's really not. It, it's not exposed at all. Scala actually did this. I worked at Scala in between uh, Commodore and Metabox, and they, it's not obvious, but on all the PC products, there's a there's a multi, there's an operating system that runs between whatever PC operating system you're running and the Scala applications. So you can move, you can port the OS and not have to change the applications, which is actually easier than porting the applications to a different OS because part of the problem is that multimedia done right is actually an OS level problem and if you don't solve it at the OS level the best application is just not going to run properly so um, the neat thing is of course then it doesn't really matter you can run it on other areas which means from a developers point of view I could write a program that I think is an Amiga program but I could still sell it to Windows people I could still sell it to Linux people um, and perhaps you know now we're talking about appliances. You can put it on a Palm. You can put it on a Windows box. You can put a Wince box. You have to say Wince. You put it on a Wince box. You put it on a uh, on a, a Zorus or something like that. If I can only get my hands on one. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so I like the strategy a lot. I mean, simply be you know simply as a uh, you know as a longtime fan of the whole Amiga thing. Plus just. Where you know an observer of where software technology ought to be going, um, Microsoft's going to hate it too because that will allow you to put programs on their op operating systems that they don't control. See, Microsoft, Microsoft's key throughout history has been control the API. If you control how how the program runs on your system, then you can prov you can make it very difficult to put. Uh, for for developers to reuse the code, so that's why Microsoft OS, the the Windows OS, um, well actually it's called Win32. It's the layer the applications usually talk to is sort of upside down compared to a normal operating system. That makes it real difficult to port programs directly from like Linux to Windows or from Windows to Linux. Um, now, if you took an Amiga program and put it on Linux, it would be fairly straightforward. I mean, there's a lot, you know, there are obviously differences to account for, but the structure of the program doesn't have to dramatically change. But when you go to Windows, it does. And they did this intentionally to make, you know, and, and then, you know, to make it difficult to port. And then there's other things that go along with it, like um, you have, 
all of these things that are need to be in place to be a, a proper Windows program. You have to have documentation done this way. You have to have this done this way. And it requires a lot of people and a lot of experts in Windows. And because of that, it means that your company, if you're developing software for Windows, is going to have a lot of people who are experts in Windows. And you need a lot of them, and it makes an ex makes the development project expensive. And you have to have all this expertise that you're probably going to reuse on your next Windows project, and maybe not, you know, and it sort of it sort of discourages supporting other markets, especially if they're that much smaller. So, you know, Microsoft gets you with a two-edged sword. Now, if, and, and this is exactly what we were saying on the cost list. If you can if you can develop an operating system that's much easier to program, BOS would be a good example of this. BOS is so much easier to program than Windows. Um, I'm, you know, I haven't actually looked at the uh, at the SDK yet, but I, I believe that the uh, Amiga DE is probably pretty similar, because um, I know it's I know it's fully object oriented, um, and the idea is if you can make something that's much easier to program, then developers, first of all, you don't need a huge team to do the same work. Because you know, when you're porting an application, what you'd like is for say 80, 90, I mean really what you'd like is 100% of your effort to be devoted on that special thing you're doing. The game, the, the nonlinear editor, the, you know, the, the music program, whatever, and not all of the details necessary to make that, that special knowledge of yours live on the operating system. Like, okay, I have to draw a window this way, I have to make a menu that way. You'd like that to be as automatic as possible. So if you do that, then all of a sudden, you know, if you can make that possible, then all of a sudden large applications um, become much smaller, they're easier to write, and now if you can take that and say, well, a small company can put out an application that compares favorably with some of these others, but can run anywhere, then you really got something. And that seems to be the direction they're heading. We'll have to see how well it works, but it seems to be the direction they're heading. So that's, that's piqued my interest because I've seen... I've, you know, and Felici told me this three years ago, when, when they, or two years ago, whenever they had settled on um, Tau. He said, we found somebody, you're going to like it. I was very, very skeptical. I guess I was wrong. <laughs> so they invited you to come on board at some point? No. I have, I, I've, I'm running engineering at Metabox right now, or at least, I, actually, what happened was I, I was, um, and still am technically, I guess, um, working with the uh, German Metabox as the uh, vice president of technology over there, but since the fall, I've been working on building up a U.S. meta box, which is a partially owned subsidiary of the parent company, and that means coming over here and we've set up an engineering department. Um, we've, we're we're working on designs of taking our European um, technology, which we call set top box, but it's like. You know, think of like a modernized Amiga 1200 that sits in your TV room, or modernized CD TV, or something like that. Um, it's really a computer. We know it's a computer, um, but it does sort of just the computer applications that would make sense in your living room. So you want to listen to music, you want to watch video. We want to basically support any sort of music format you want, any sort of video format you want. Store a lot of this on the hard disk so that you don't have to. You don't have to keep changing so you know you want to get video from uh, cable TV you want to get it from satellite that's okay you know assuming we can connect um, you want to get it from broadband which is going to be a big growing thing mainly because the people out there who are selling broadband have discovered that there are only so many people who will pay you know twenty five dollars a month thirty dollars a month sixty dollars a month whatever for a broadband connection to surf the net on the other hand there's there's zillions of people out there paying seventy dollars a month for cable, you know for full cable with eight, with all the services so once they can offer video over broadband in a reasonable way in other words it has to look like television not like computer um, they're going to have a zillion more customers so that we're kind of you know we're we're entering that market. A lot of people are entering that market, but we're entering that market. And I think we have actually a lot of Amiga experience applied here because we know how to build the right kind of operating system for this job. Um, which uh, our operating system is actually fairly similar in concept to the um, original Amiga OS. It's not the same, but it's similar in concept. It's all written in C. <laughs> But um, it's not a clone, but it's you know you know it's it's a similar idea, sort of sort of like um, there was Unix, then there was Linux. You know, Linux li Linux is actually closer because that that is almost a clone. It's very easy to recompile programs, but we run we run we run we run MUI, we run Voyager, 
various Amiga pit, bits and pieces that we could pick up because there's a lot of a lot of developers out there who own their own code and say, you know, we'd like a web browser. Well, look, there's there's a bunch of web browsers on the Amiga which may not quite be in you know an IE or a Netscape, but they're a whole lot better than the embedded web browsers out there that are basically HTML 3.2 and you know no JavaScript, no nothing. Well, uh, we're we're we've moved quite a bit beyond that. So for people who want to keep up with what Dave Haney's doing, what's a good place to look? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Call me up once in a while. No, um, I you know you can you can look at Metabox and see what we do. MetaboxUSA.com. Um, is a good place to look so you can see how that's going um, you know what we do in the US market um, you know if you're rich well you can sign up as an investor <laughs> <laughs> I would like to touch one more on uh, the deathbed vigil okay um, from your perspective uh, you know I've seen the tape some people yeah. have seen the tape but it's hard to find uh, yeah. give us your perspective on, on uh, you know that process uh, the process of shooting it. Shooting it? And, oh, and this okay. Story. Okay. Well, basically, um, we knew that Commodore was going down pretty quickly at this point, and um, I was away the weekend before this this whole thing took place. I'd been away in, in Texas. I, I had an interview with a company called Mizar. I had another interview with a company called Compaq. It was actually it was exactly what I expected to be. They had an entire department of people doing about one person's job, <laughs> um, and it wasn't an interesting job. Um, so I, I but it, I was in Texas anyway. So I went to I went to Compaq and uh, I came back. I had been away Monday. I came in on Tuesday, and because I'd been in I'd been in Texas, and my wife had said, "Well, if you like it." film, you know, show me what Texas is like, this part of Texas, because she only knew about like Amarillo or, you know, out where the cactuses grow tall and the armadillos run around. And um, so I, I didn't really film much because I was pretty sure I wasn't going to go work there. And I came back and I had a camera and I, on the way to work that morning, I said, well, you know, who knows what's going to happen. I heard, I heard a lot of bad things. People had actually left me email that was saying, you know, some bad things might be happening. So um, I went to Kmart and they, fortunately they had eight millimeter tapes. So I grabbed three tapes and my batteries were already charged. So I just brought my camcorder and my old Sony TR7 or whatever it was. And, um, I just started filming and along the way, you know, the wheels were turning and I started thinking, well, you know, I should make a video, you know, put this out for people. And, you know, as it grew and, you know, it kind of took on a life of its own. So we, you know, so the very, you know, it just turned out that the very next day there was this big layoff. So I, and I still had the camcorder out in the car. So I, you know, I, I filmed that. And then, um, because, um, I guess largely because of the layoff and because a lot of people were going to be in town for Mike Sins's wedding. Randall Jessup through this deathbed vigil party. What we didn't know, what none of us knew that day was that Commodore had declared bankruptcy Friday after the close of business because we were all at Mike's wedding. So I get in there the next morning and there's, the, actually I, it wasn't quite like that because I had gone to, uh, I'd gone to uh, the, the good uh, li uh, beer distributor to get um, some beer for the party and I, I saw this, uh, what, you know, the Westchester press or whatever it was called that said Commodore, you know, um, uh, they had some clever way of saying Commodore's uh, gone like, you know, uh, you know, um, Commodore powers down or something like that. And it's like, what the hell? And sure enough, uh, you know, we, and we had, so we had people from all over town, ex-Commodore people going way back and, you know, just everybody like, oh, well, you know, I mean, half the people there weren't working for Commodore even before the layoff anymore because there'd just been so many people who had left for one reason or another. Um, as things were getting worse, I was still there. I was still in, but I, <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't get fired after the film came. Actually, the film didn't come out until after I had left. But, um, but you know, I I was um, just filming, and then I had to take my uh, I had to take my son home. So he, he came out to me with, with me to the party, and it's like an, it was like an hour drive each way. So I handed the camera to to Fred Bowen and Keith Gabrielski and let them just keep filming. And when I came back, they had they had really uh, set up the camera on a tripod and just were getting people gathered in front of it to tell stories. And it's like, this is cool. So that's, that's where all those stories came from. And um, then, the, then uh, some dark, mysterious figure took my camera and filmed this parking lot scene. That nobody knows who that was, but, 
But anyway, so then I, I decided to edit this, and I really wasn't a video guy. I never did this stuff at, well during Commodore, but I thought, well, you know, that was sort of the promise of the Amiga 3000 was that any fool, and that pretty much describes me, would sit down and be able to make a movie. And so I got, I, I actually, I got, because I was going to work for Scala soon anyway, I, well actually it wasn't quite then, but um, I got the, uh, the Scala um, video editing software which was basically just this little module that let you control a, a, a camera via, via control L port and um, infrared. It let you control the camera and the, and the recording deck. I went out and bought a good SVHS deck um, so I could do some editing and I put this whole Scala thing together. I borrowed a, a time-based corrector from a guy uh, who used to work at GVP and I borrowed a, a, a Genlock and just put the whole thing together. It took me it took me a long, long time to put it together and get it right. And you know, it was like you know, it was very audio, you know, very manual at the time. I had a I had a little Radio Shack mixer for audio. I had cause I had the music on the cassette. I had little tape cues of where you know where okay, cue number one, I have to slide the sliders here. Cue number two, I have to slide the sliders here, and so on. And so it was you know it was very very it was like it was more like a performance than an editing session. But you know so that's that's why some of the cuts are a little raw. <laughs> But what can you do? Um, and last last weekend, I uh, I finally converted it to digital. So it's uh, I sucked it in uh, into my uh, one gigahertz uh, Athlon machine, doing real time MPEG two encoding at 15 megabits per second. Then I con then I uh, transcoded it to uh, DV format, and then I like did a little bit of little bit of cleanup editing and and set it up for two tapes because of course it's DV it's only mini DV it's only one one hour each and I I use uh, the, the Sonic Foundry Video Vegas tools because I I have friends at Sonic Foundry and they they actually know how to program multimedia even under Windows it's pretty amazing uh, <laughs> so is that is the deathbed visual going to be available to people we're going to see I have actually found a little interest here of uh, somebody putting it out on video which is good because it's been out of it's been out of print for a couple of years now since Dale uh, decided to, uh, at the time, close shop and go to Cal go to uh, Hawaii and learn to surf. <laughs> um, yeah, Dale Larson used to used to do it, and now it's. Uh, I guess I can change the uh, title credits now since there's no reason of having that little IAM slide at the very end. But um, but it, yeah, it's um, you know I think I think we'll find some home for it. It's it is on the. Uh, it is on the Amiga Forever CD in in MPEG form. They crunched. They they took that from a uh, from a SV uh, from a regular production VHS tape. This the one I ha I just recently made came from the master tape and hopefully looks good. I I couldn't. I never actually looked at it. It sounded good. I I did a lot of improvements to the sound because I, I, because you can <laughs> with modern with modern gear and um, the the, you know, the only downside is that it had never been through a PC before. It was done 100 percent on Amiga initially, and it's like, well, I can't really do you know. I have I actually I don't have that that A3000 Plus is somewhere in Scalarette's house, um, the one that I actually used for editing. So it was it was all done on an A3000 Plus. My A3000 does. I don't have any of those tools anyway, because I still I don't do that much video on the um, Amiga anymore. I do admit to doing it on the PC because I have a FireWire connection. <laughs> um, do you have any personal stories about Petro, and what are your feelings about his retiring? Um, I don't. Yeah, you know, I I kind of know Petro. I don't. You know, I don't know him that well. I you know I knew who he was when I was consulting with Amiga Technologies. I guess I guess we'd maybe met once or twice before then. And um, I don't know if I have any real stories. I mean, I had, um, I you know, we we were, you know, I, I was I was really glad that we had the kind of people we had at Amiga Technologies because you know, I mean, Petros Petro gave it continuity, which was a nice thing. Is that they were bringing so many people um, who had nothing to do with Amiga before. Petro coming and running it was like, okay, this is still, you know, this is still. Amiga, there, there's a, you know there's a continuity here that didn't exist before, um, and there I mean there were a few other people who were in the company then, but it, you know it sort of sort of gave us a bridge. I, you know that was that was actually going to be a really good project. I think that the whole uh, Amiga Technologies thing had the SCOM not chosen why, unwisely and lost all that money in the PC business. I mean they were the second largest PC company in Germany. 
but they they kind of wanted to be the radio shack of europe they were or or maybe the gateway now that you have gateway country stores everywhere they were opening they were just overextending themselves and at the same time they guessed wrong and didn't sell enough PCs and it's also real easy to go out of business in Germany because they're they're very strict laws over there compared to ours so you know just it just worked out bad what are you gonna say um, you know I you know and, and you know and I you know I mean Petro you know Petro it takes a lot of energy and you know I think I think the thing is that Pet, you know I think one statement about Petro retiring is that he I think he believes that it's in good hands now because you can see you know he, he was following it every step of the way he was instrumental in getting excuse me some of these deals made that I mean you know we were you know we were all like this <laughs> but what can you do you know I wasn't involved directly after Amiga uh, Technologies I didn't have any say I was a technical guy anyway I wasn't a business person so um, you know, it's funny how sometimes you have to become a business person, but um, but he uh, you know he was instrumental in getting all these done, and uh, you know and you know at this point you know I, I think the relationship between Petro and uh, today's Amiga is good, and um, he's like you know okay, it's in good hands now, you know. He passed the torch. Yeah, yeah. He you know he you know and I, I don't I honestly don't think he'd be retiring if he thought there was going to be more problems. And that's, to me, that's a good sign. I heard something about a chipset called Ombre. There was an Ombre. What's but that? it was never finished. Okay, Ombre was basically the follow-up to AAA. Um, this was something that Ed Hepler was working on. Ed Hepler is like, um, he's kind of like the Carl Sassenrath of chips. He's like, you know, he's got this mind that's just, you know, bizarrely creative. <laughs> and um, Ombre was this thing he was designing kind of on his own time. He, he, was in, he was working on the early AAA architecture and stuff, and then he moved on to Ombre. Well, part of the problem with AAA was just really expensive to build. And because it had to be exactly compatible, but it turns out that there was just architectural constraints that weren't going to let it be 100% compatible anyway in most implementations. So Ombre was the idea of, um, it was actually synthesizing two ideas. The other idea that we had, of course, were things like CD32. We're building a game machine. Okay, so what Ombre did was it coupled a, a brand new chip architecture, um, not... Amiga in concept, but not Amiga in you know register map and all that. Um, that was going to do things like um, they weren't so much they weren't going to do color lookup tables anymore. It's just going to be 16-bit color or 32-bit color. You could have four play fields at 16 bits, you know, direct color. Um, they were um, uh, there was a, a 3D not really 3D processor as you'd see today with a you know 50 stage pipeline or whatever but there was a there was actually a uh, um, there's actually a CPU with 3D instructions on the chip as well so for for like a game machine you could have these two chips that would sit there and that would be the game machine pretty much the whole thing maybe you need a sound chip or something like that okay and it was going to be cheap and extremely powerful because they were they were using a uh, um, PA risk processor that Ed actually designed himself um, and uh, then you could take this and put it on a PCI card, and then it would become a graphics board with its own auxiliary processor just to target the graphics. So it was very advanced for the time. Um, would have been pretty comparable with the uh, with the game machines that came out later, like um, in Nintendo 64 or Sony PlayStation. I'm not sure, you know, exactly because we it was never finished. Um, and we were we were teaming up with HP at the time. HP wanted to use this card in their workstations as their graphics board, you know, for you know for low end workstations that ran off PCI. So it, it seemed like a really good idea. It's just that Commodore didn't last long enough to finish it. And um, Ed is last I heard has his own consulting company. He's designed like an 80 megahertz, 68,000 core. You, know, you can offer in VHDL or whatever. And he's he also teaches at Villanova University. It's funny because one of these small world things, a, a fraternity brother of mine went to do graduate work at Villanova and knows Ed. <laughs> um, one last question. <clears throat> Room parties at Amiga shows are legendary for how wild and crazy they are. Can you tell me about that? Oh, <laughs> I'm not sure I remember any of those room parties. Well, we did. I mean, we had... Um, it depends on what shows they were. I mean, there were Amiga shows. There were, um, there were trade shows. Um... I remember like one year 
um, it was one of the first trade shows I ever went to. We um, we went to this hotel in uh, Chicago, um, Conrad Hilton Hotel, and we were in these little rooms. It was really hot because it was summertime, and um, one of the uh, I was I forget I, I might have been rooming with Greg Berlin, but anyway, it was like okay. We, the minute we got there, it's like somebody's like okay, start loading the ice, and I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, there's like this bucket brigade of ice going into the bathtub, and pretty soon, like cases of beer arrive. <laughs> it's like we're barely even, uh, you know, the bags are barely put down, and you know, and and um, it, that was actually pretty. That was sort of the. That was sort of at the height of the 8-bit world, where Commodore was rich, flying high. The Commodore 64 was destroying everything. And we were in the booth right next to Coleco. And it was funny, because these poor Coleco people had to look at the Commodore 64, which was destroying their chance to launch the Coleco Atom even before it came out of the box. And unfortunately, we were also showing off the Plus 4 then. And people were coming by and asking, now, why do I want to buy the Plus 4 when the C64 over there has all this software? And you know, I was sitting there trying to, well, <laughs> but it does this. And <laughs> we have a fast hard drive or a fast floppy disk for it and that sort of thing. So, you know, but yeah, we had, I mean, there were parties that, um, the, I guess the neat thing about being at um, Commodore, uh, and Amiga for all those years was that you you got to know people in the developer community and you see you know you'd see them once a year or maybe twice a year or something like that at these conferences and I mean there were wild things people pulled pranks I mean there were there were all night hacking sessions so like the computer rooms were kept open um, well developers were always showing stuff off so sometimes they were working on the last minute fix before they shut it off um, you know there were I mean there were nights like like one year we one year um, at a conference, we decided somebody decided we wanted to do karaoke, so we were just like driving around town like madmen trying to find karaoke bars. <laughs> um, you know, it's I, you know it's hard to say any one particular incident. I there are a couple pictures of me floating around at one point where where I guess I had fallen asleep at a, a party and it was kind of like this, and people were like putting things in my face and. <laughs> Which was kind of neat. So um, you know, oh, uh, and uh, part of part of the thing that went on with this, of course, was that you know you didn't necessarily get much sleep the week before a show, and you know sometimes not even before a conference. I remember one time when I was working on a, uh, it was the uh, the eighty five no, it was the uh, twenty six thirty board, and there was some problem with it I was trying to solve, and and there was also a memory board that went with it that had 16 megabytes of RAM, which was like amazing. So um, this is that was never manufactured, but it was it was sort of a test of concept thing. And Henry Rubin really wanted this done, so he was saying you you know you you stay an extra day, and I'm like, but I'm my ticket. And he's like, here, he he gave me his first class ticket, said you know you come the next day. Um, he took the pet jet with Irving, and. Uh, so I worked like basically without not you know totally nonstop. Got it working, basically just you know packed up, took off to the airport, walked in like I you know, I'm like this you know this Aqualong guy with like you know beard and a, you know haven't showered or anything and you know here you go Henry. <laughs> so uh, you know and that and of course after that uh, you know after several days like that you really 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 just need to cut loose and um, you know there was there was kind of this um, oh there's this tradition at um, at um, Commodore in La anytime we went to Las Vegas, I don't know where it came from, but but okay, Irving Gould would be there. But Irving Gould is has the citizen of the world kind of thing going. He doesn't want to pay anybody any taxes. His residence is the Bahamas, but if he stays in the U.S. like a little bit too much, he has to start paying U.S. taxes. So, oh, you know, I don't I don't know what he's doing these days, but this is what he was doing then. So he would always leave a show a day early. And he would always have this nice big suite, usually on the top floor somewhere, with you know bar and you know bedroom or two, and you know conference tables and things. So so they would always throw the uh, they would always throw the show party at, um, at almost always at, at Irving Gould's uh, suite. So you know we'd go to the suite, we we drink Irving's beer as much you know whatever else we you know we just have this wild party, and usually that was the wildest one because you can only go get so crazy in the middle of a week during a show. Um, you know whether it was a trade show or or a conference the last night you knew well i don't really have to get up and work tomorrow so we'd go to that then um for some reason i don't know who found this place but there's this dance club like in the desert called botanies so we'd all we'd all pack up and into cabs or whatever go out to botanies and close the place down they closed at like two or three in the morning 
and you had to be careful because like taxis really didn't want to go out there so you kind of had to call like with plenty of time but my gang usually me and Greg Berlin and sometimes Fred Bowen if he was out and a few others did not really do that we just walked back well halfway between botanies and where the hotel was was the strip bar called the crazy horse saloon and at four in the morning there's no cover charge or anything the place is empty except for the dancers and so we'd go in there and you know watch naked girls dance around until the sun came up and you know have a few beers and then just continue on to the hotel pack the bags get on the plane and you know and i'll tell you you want to see wasteland on that airport you know you see all these engineers who are you know maybe hung over, certainly just totally exhausted from working real hard, because shows, any kind of show is a lot of work. I mean, whether you're talking, you know, if it's, if it's a developer's conference, you're up constantly, you know, you stay up late, you get up early, you give speeches, you never, ever, ever stop talking for three or four days. You're on your feet almost the entire time. Um, like, well, this is an example of what, what it's, you know, the feet. We found at one trade show that I think it was NEC's booth had really thick foam under their carpeting. <laughs> so we were like, any chance you got, you'd walk over to NEC's booth and just walk around because it felt better than standing on the normal, uh, you know, Commodore, uh, you know, AstroTurf or whatever, <laughs> indoor outdoor carpeting. Little things like that. Those are fun days. I, you know, I, I don't know if we ha I haven't done a whole lot of that lately. We're not we're not big enough at Metabox yet to have real shows. I think we're going to be at NAB, but just a, we're going to have a suite, to show off our stuff. Um, I'm blanking. Uh, oh, what do you have to tell um, Amiga users or people who are interested in following your career? What would you like to communicate to people out there? Don't do it. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. Following my career, I mean, it's you know, a lot, a lot has been written and said. I guess people can pretty much know what they want to know. Um, you know, to do this sort of thing, you just you need to uh, you, you need to work hard. You need to um, you know, you need to be creative too. You need to have ideas. You need to have some luck. Um, I started at Commodore because I'd worked at General Electric for four months and I didn't like it there, it was boring. Some people like that, you know, some people just, you know, you come in, you get paid, you go home, do a little work. I wanted, you know, I wanted something challenging, I wanted something that was, uh, you know, that wasn't using, General Electric had government contracts and government would pay for engineers, they would not pay for new VAX. So we had 50 people on this ancient VAX and you, I, I learned a lot about VMS and how to schedule tasks that, that snuck in, gave me more cycles than anybody else. And I learned this in a very short amount of time, but it still wasn't enough. I wrote a Lisp interpreter while I was there waiting for, as I was doing CAD work, I was doing uh, computer simulations that took like hours to run. I was also maintaining the compiler that ran these CAD simulations. So um, it was just not work I was interested in. Plus there was a lot of nasty military work there that I didn't really agree with. So I decided one day, I'm going to leave. And I, wrote, I, sent a, I sent a letter to one headhunter, the one headhunter in the Philadelphia Inquirer listing that didn't say no entry level positions. Because I was just, I'd been only working for, you know, four months plus a couple summer jobs at Bell Labs. I, I mean, I had pretty good credentials, but um, so I was, uh, that was on a Tuesday. Thursday, this headhunter calls me up and said, we'd like you to come in. And here I was, like, I, I was trying, I was always trying to subvert the GE system, because you saw a bunch of people coming in all like college students and slowly one by one they sort of faded into the background and started looking like GE people and I, I refused I wasn't gonna wear a, j a jacket and that but I was I was like wearing kind of like like I'd wear black jeans instead of blue jeans because they didn't want blue jeans this day I had on like uh, khakis or something and a homemade shirt but you can only tell it was homemade up close so I um, I went in to this headhunter that day and here I was, I, I go into the lobby, and there's this guy who, um, I don't know if you call him, he, he, was, he was like, I mean, he really looked like a hippie, way more than I did. Uh, my hair was a little shorter at the time, not that much shorter, but a little shorter. And, I, and um, 
I, so I started talking with this guy, and you know, he's yeah you know, here for a job, yeah, I'm here for a job, you know, and um, so then this, you know, then they called Mr. Haney, and they, you know, they called me in, and um, I talked to Joe Kazuki, who was the uh, director of engineering at the time, and and then they put me in this other room, and there's that hippie guy, and that was Bill Hurd, and he just asked me a few questions, you know, do you know how to do Laplace transforms? Well, yeah, sure, and I, oh, I just want to know because that's one thing I don't know, and he was he was like looking looking to fill in holes in his own experience with the guy he hired, and so. I, I thought it went well, and they said we'll be in touch. And they called me up on Monday and said, "Can you come out to the plant?" And so, in less than a week, right there on the spot, they offered me a job. I said yes, gave notice at GE. But what if I decided to apply two weeks later for a new job? <laughs> you know, because I mean, you know, I was at, fresh out of school. I thought it was kind of, you know, I was a little bit scared. It's like, are they going to think I'm just like hopping jobs, trying to build up the salary a little or something? You know, there's always, you know. So it worked out good. You know, I was there for 11 and a half years. <laughs> but you know, I mean, that's you know, that's the kind of thing where you know, it, it, you went right instead of left. Something different's going to happen. So you know, do what you can to make your own course because you're not going to be able to control those other things that you can't like common or going out of business so you know you try to rebuild it somewhere else or uh, or come up with something you know come up with a gig that's just as cool not an easy task but I'm still working on it <laughs> others may find the same thing great okay I don't know I think we're done okay thanks very much sure <laughs>